As you know, we're starting an introduction into the cults. All right, so we have we've kind of been looking at different world religions. We started months ago just with an introduction on worldviews and different worldviews and how people look at life through what they believe. And we've worked our way through different religions uh, in the world, and now we are moving to a specific kind of group called the cults. All right, and normally we hear that word and we automatically like think certain things, right? It, it, there's different uh, thoughts that come to our mind, maybe a specific cult that comes to mind just by hearing that word and so forth. But just kind of getting a specific understanding of what a cult is, uh, thoughts of what they believe. And yeah, there are different ones, right? And those different cults, they have different beliefs or uh, different things that they, they hold and value. And we'll get to some of those specifics based on those specific uh, different cults. But there are some really basic similarities that run through the cults, okay? So I think we should start off by, uh, if, you, if you would, go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And just to kind of look at a few verses here before we, we start explaining a cult. Verse number 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which really is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have than that which we have already preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have already received, let him be accursed. And I think it's interesting here, as Paul is telling the Galatians, you've heard the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. And there's already some people coming in and they're twisting the truth of the gospel and they're telling you something different as if it's another gospel, but it's not another, right? There is no other real gospel, but they're teaching you as if there was something different. Don't be changed. And whether, even if I were to come and preach a different one to you, or if an angel were to come and preach something different to you, that is not the gospel. And I think that's very, inter I, I think that's really interesting. Because so often, when we're looking at these cults, some angel was involved, or there's some mystic revelation involved to give this great insight to someone else for this other gospel. And uh, Paul is warning them, don't be removed. There is the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. That is the gospel. And there isn't any other. There's no other gospel. Um, so before we continue on, let's pray. And then I want to do some discussion and then we're going to, uh, or I want to share some things uh, about the definition and characteristics of cults and then I want us to have some group involvement. So you're going to be testing your Bible knowledge, all right? Lord, thank you very much for this afternoon and, and I pray that you would have control of the message in our time together. You would teach us things that you want us to learn and help us to share these with other people, that your truths are the other people, so that they can know and trust in Jesus the Messiah for who you say he is in your word. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I just want to, now, back, I can't even remember what, when that was, when we first came in and started the different worldviews. Um, I had shared some different things, and I, I had mentioned a couple books that, I'm using as references, uh, and I want to make sure I, I mention those only because I'm using them to make some very specific points in our teaching, and so I don't want to take credit for those nice points if it wasn't mine. So it's uh, so. What's the difference? By a man named Fritz Rittenauer, and then a very popular book on the cults, which is called The Kingdom of the Cults, by Walter Martin. All right. So I just want to make sure I. I mention that so you don't think that I came up with all these great clever ideas and uh, take the credit for me. It wasn't me and my 
fantastic wisdom. All right. Um, what is a cult? Who can who can define what it means? What the word cult means? Yeah, Amos. Uh, I can't tell, but I have an idea. It's a it's a group of people that have uh, gone in a certain in a certain direction, uh, or break away from uh, from the from the Bible. Yeah. That's good. That's right. Anybody else have a thought? Yeah, Warren. People who come up with ideas based on nothing. <laughs> a, somebody who comes up with a group of ideas based on nothing. Okay. And Miss Liz. I think it's worship of a person who's promoting. Okay, worship of a person who's promoting that idea and group. Okay. Yeah, these are these are good definitions. Really, a cult in general is any any turning from the truth or orthodoxy, right? It might be some people might say, well, it's a it's a like a a different turning and a different uh, belief than the main belief of that specific culture. All right, it 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 is really a turning though from the truth. And when we think of it as Bible believing Christians, it's a group of people whose belief is twisted and turned from the Bible. Yes? Um, a cult is, um, I believe, they manipulate the people's mm. minds. They make them believe something that is not true. And so, um, they're following something that they really don't even know what it is, but mm. yet they fall into Mm. It's not a God. Right. So they, they live confused lives. Yeah. Everywhere they go, they, they don't really see the truth because their minds are so manipulated yeah. by these, mm -hmm. I still call, say, demons because whoever preaches things like that is from the devil, not from God. That's right. So that's yeah. what I say. That's right. That is correct. Yeah, that, that is true. It, 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 it is... Um, from from our point of view, it's it's really a group that doesn't hold to the orthodox or the biblical Christian views, and uh, it's it's really just to make sure we as when we use the word, we're understanding what we're saying, right? It's it's just a way of uh, semantics to make sure we're clear on what we're meaning, right? There are differences. I want to make sure we have it. We have an understanding. There's a difference between a cult and different denominations, right? So a cult is a group of people who have turned away from the biblical foundation and the biblical truth. Now, they will probably claim that they're following the Bible and they believe the Bible, but obviously they don't. Whenever you look at the Bible for what it says, it's a, it's a deviation, right? Now, there are different denominations of Christianity, and, and those are different, but for the main truths and facts of who God is, there are there's an agreement, right? We might there might be some differences normally on some application things or uh, thoughts about this view or that view, and there's some differences. Um, but when we're talking about a cult, we're talking about a group who is turning away really from the truth and the, the orthodox truths found in the Bible. It's a turning away from the Bible. All right. They, they claim often that the Bible is their source, but it's often not, right? It's often, as was mentioned by a few people, some leader or group of leaders that they're following. Somebody has kind of come up with this idea, this new interpretation per se, and they've established this group and now they're getting followers and their followers are going to follow them. So here's are some things that distinguish a cult from true Christianity. Okay, number one, they reject the Trinity. The main thing is Jesus is not God. Right? Jesus is not what the Bible clearly says He is. Alright? So for a cult, one of the main things, right? The big one. They reject the Trinity. 
There, God, Jesus is not God. Now they can, they will use the same words. He's the Son of God. Yeah, he's the Son of God. They don't mean what the Bible means when they say he's the Son of God. So it's very important when you're speaking with people that are involved in a cult that you define the term. Because when you say, you know, Jesus is the Son of God, you need to believe in Him, they're going to turn around and say, yes, He is the Son of God, I do believe in Him. They don't mean what you mean, right? They mean something totally different, but you're, they're using the exact same words that you're using. So that's one point, they reject the Trinity. Number two, they usually believe that all Christian churches are wrong and that their specific group is the only one that's right. We are right. Everyone else is wrong. All right? Third, they often claim to believe the Bible, but they distort its teachings to suit their peculiar view of a particular subject. All right? They also, number four, deny that people can be saved by faith in Christ alone. That's important. Right? We believe Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in flesh. He died for us. We have salvation in Him and in Him alone. A cult won't teach that. A cult will also give you a whole bunch of things that you need to do in order to gain favor or access to God or to achieve whatever eternal bliss or whatever they might think or say is in the future, if there is a future, right? Jesus' work on the cross didn't accomplish that. you got to keep adding to it. And then last, they often use biblical terminology, but they don't believe the same things that the Bible says. Look, it is, it is, it is huge and important because the cults are following these people, right? Somebody established the cult or a couple people kind of made up these rules and established and they have given those people this high position of authority. Whatever he said, whatever she said is what we have to do. Yeah, they might have messed up and contradicted themselves a lot of times, but we've adjusted that, right? Okay? Or they came back later and they, they, they noticed that didn't make sense, so they fixed it. But whatever they say is what we're going to do. We're different. We look at the Bible. Whatever the Bible says is what we want to do. And when we're gathered around in worshiping the Lord, when we come to church, we're opening our Bibles together as someone is preaching and teaching, right? Nobody says, hey, close your Bibles and let me just tell you what God's Word says and you just do what I say. No. Guys, open your Bibles with me. Look at God's Word with me so as we're going through it, you can see what God is saying for yourself. Some of these cults say if you're going to read the Bible, you need to make sure you're reading along with the, the leader or now the current leader's interpretation of those passages. Because if, if, if it, let's say, it says yes, you know, the Bible is saying yes, but the interpreter is saying no, you need to believe the interpreter because you're just not understanding. The interpreter was more enlightened than you were. We don't go by that. We say, what does the Bible say? And that is where our faith needs to be. It should not be on what he said, what she said. What does God say? That's how I want to live. We often and openly encourage you, read God's Word on your own. Daily. You want to grow in the Lord? You want to know what God has for you? Read His Word yourself. Don't read my words. Don't read other, other people's words just to, for them to tell you. Read God's Word yourself and get to know God. 
right? Get to know and understand who He is and what He's saying for you. It is a complete, total opposite from the cults who don't want you to look and interpret the Bible for what it says. They want you to read what they want you to read and understand only what you want so they can have a little bit of grip and control over that person, right? Now, yeah. No, I just want to say, well, you got you got the uh, the help of the spirit of truth to lead you on to all truth. So it's not you doing it by yourself. It's exactly right. The spirit of God who opens our hearts, who is our teacher, who is our helper, and he explains the word to us. That's exactly right. And see, we want us to be in God's word, right? Because when you're in God's word, you're exposing yourself and allowing God to speak to your heart. He'll explain it. He'll make it clear. He'll help you understand. Now, yes, He has given people different ministries in teaching and explaining and helping to clarify God's Word. And there's nothing wrong with reading a a book for Christians or even a commentary. But never should we exalt commentaries or books above God's Word. Right? And we should not always say, well, so-and-so wrote it in a book and it was published and he's like a well-known person, so therefore you should do exactly what he says. You should always check it yourself against what? The Word of God. Always check it against the Word of God. You know, I, I try to be, a, I think, a pretty um, honest person when it comes to different, different things. So if, if I have a $100 bill, right, and I'm going to maybe a, a restaurant or a grocery store, perhaps I've been there many times, you know, I pay for my food, I normally don't stick stuff in my coat and walk out, right? I, I'm normally paying for my food and I, I buy my groceries all the time and I always pay for it. If I slip them a $100 bill, is that person behind the counter going to say, you know what, he's honest? He probably doesn't have a ham under his coat, right? He's not trying to sneak out with the expensive steaks. I'm going to I'm going to just trust this guy that the $100 bill is right and we'll take it. What are they going to do? Doesn't matter who I am. They're going to take the little marker or whatever they do and they're going to check to make sure the $100 bill is right. They're going to check is he lying? Is he being honest? Is this really 100 bucks? Right? They're going to check it. That's what we need to be doing. Even if it's a godly Christian person telling us stuff and, and, and teaching and preaching, we always want to look at what does God's Word say? It does say that. I've never seen that before. That's really helpful. And our basis for faith is right there found in God's Word. That's what will stand. The Bible stands. And God uses people to point us right back to the Bible, to explain the Bible, to get us to look at the Bible. So when we need something to stand on, we stand on the Bible. The Bible. And that is the difference, guys. We need to be people of the Bible. Let me tell you, when you're interacting with someone who's in a cult, and they start saying things, and then they start saying verses, and you don't know what the Bible says, boy, you're gonna get you're gonna get start getting some confusion in yourself. Wait, that verse that is a verse in the Bible, you know, and they'll point out one verse even to you when they're refuting something, and you're gonna be like, wait, it, what? It does say that? Wait, that doesn't make right? If you don't know what the Bible says, it's a problem. You can start to get a little confused and clouded. Galatians! Don't be confused. There's no other gospel. There's the one gospel. Guys, we need to be immersed in the Bible. Can't stress it enough. And I think all of us would sit here and say, that's true. That's true. Brother David, we do need to be in the Bible. I agree with that. Do you so wholeheartedly agree with it? that you're going to read the Bible this week on your own? Do you really wholeheartedly agree that you need to be in God's Word so much that it's going to make a difference on your life tomorrow because you're actually going to read it? 
Or is it, Brother Dave, I agree, amen, we need to be in God's Word. I'll see you next Sunday so I can get some fill of God's Word. Hey, where, where is it? You agree you need to be in God's Word? You agree that it's truth? You agree that this is the basis of our faith? Then why are we not in God's Word? Yes, Miss Liz. I know some call it study. They have classes and sessions. Should we view study and rather than get into an argument, I'll just focus on maybe John 3.16. Mm. And as they try to start an argument, bring it like before the grand trial. Who's <laughs> right? Who knows who No. I won't get into that. Yeah, no. Focus on yeah. a verse. That's right. Some common factors related to um, the cults and really some of the psychological implications, right, that the cults put on the people. Really, it's there's some psychological stuff going on. The first is belief systems of cults are often characterized by closed-mindedness, right? This is what we believe. Don't talk to other people. Don't have dialogue with other people about it. This, the authority has said this is what it is. Therefore, don't you contradict the authority. Don't even think about it. They said this. If somebody else starts to say things and it starts becoming doesn't sound to line up with what our authority said, then you just, you just stop talking to them. Don't keep going. Write that down because we'll make sure the next group of people skip that house when they go door to door, right? Close-mindedness. Keep the people close-minded so they don't have dialogue and speak. That's, that's like basic for our culture and the, the, the American culture and what it was founded on for people to discuss and debate and dialogue so people can change views and mindsets and have a better understanding on something. One person has an opinion. The other person has an opinion. As soon as you just like refuse to talk to one another and share each other's advice and opinions and views, you're still stuck like this. But look, now this person says this, this person says that. Now he could say, oh, I was completely wrong. You were right. Or he might say, hey, some of that is right. And he'll say, some of yours is right. And now they come to a new conclusion together. It's good. It's healthy to talk, to discuss your thoughts and opinions with other people. Any of you uh, have a spouse, right? Have you ever had two different opinions as a spouse? Yeah. Yeah. I got mine. She has hers. Right? Do we just keep going about and not talk? That's a bad idea. Right? That's a, that's a bad idea. You talk. You talk it out. You explain. This is why. This is what. And blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it's this way. Sometimes it's this way. Sometimes people aren't happy. But you come to a conclusion because you need to and you talk about it. You talk through things. But they are telling their people, follow what we say, keep your minds closed, and don't listen to what other people are talking about. I don't want you to think, because as soon as you start thinking, you might, you, you might leave, right? I want you to say, ignorant, stop thinking, and just do what you're told, right? So that's one part of the psychological aspect of it. The other one is it's characterized by a genuine antagonism on a personal level. So it's basically this, right? We believe the truth. Whatever other people believe, is false. I can't, I can't interact with that falsehood at all. Therefore, a person who believes in that falsehood is bad and evil and horrible. Therefore, I must stay away from that person. So now, not only are they avoiding a closed-mindedness to even think about what true Bible believers believe, they're, they're going to say true Bible believers and anyone else. They believe something that's wrong, therefore I can't even be involved with them as a person. Can't interact with them or have a deep relationship with them because they in and of themselves, big X, right? Bad. Here it is. How do we break through that barrier? Love. Love. That's how we break through that specific barrier. Because they see us and they hear from us and they think, oh, he's one of those Bible believers. 
he's wrong, he's evil, he's, he's horrible. And all of a sudden, wow, he showed love to me. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. I've been taught that they're like horrible, bad, evil, and, and all of a sudden this Bible-believing guy who doesn't believe at all the same thing I believe is now showing this kind of love to me, and that doesn't make sense. It's really very similar to all the other kinds of world religious views and people. How do they see a difference? They see God's love through us. That is a huge difference, right? Isn't God's love far different than any other kind of human love we see? When they see God's love, it makes all the difference in the world. So how do I compare? How do I break through that, that censor that they have over me? Love them. Love them. Oh, no man anything whatsoever except to love him. When you when you owe someone something, you're indebted to that person, you gotta you gotta pay it to them, right? Oh man, I gotta give that person $150 or whatever. Oh, you know, I'm gonna hide from them because I owe them 150 bucks. Guess what? It's not that you owe somebody money, you owe them love. You're indebted to love all people. You are indebted to all people to show them love. That's hard. That's really hard. There are some people, you don't mind, all right, I can be indebted to love my wife. All right, that's fine. I'll deal with that. You, you want me to love, and you want me to be indebted to that person, to, 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 to love that person? They annoy me, right? They aggravate me. I don't, I don't even want to go to work on Monday because I have to see him, right? But God says, owe no man anything except you're going to have to owe them love. You're indebted to every single person to show them love. And that's how we're going to break through and give them the gospel because it's not our love. It's not that you have to wake up in the morning and say, all right, I'm really going to work really hard to love today. I don't feel like it. And I'm in a bad mood, right? But God says, I got to love, therefore I'm just going to try it, right? You're starting off on the wrong foot. God, I can't love. I really don't feel like loving. I'm not in the mood right now. But you love them and you can love through me. And then all of a sudden, the acts of kindness are coming out. You're not being rude, you're not being selfish, you're not being jealous. And it's God's love pouring out through somebody who can't be loved, right? We show them love. That's a huge thing because they've already closed mind, they're closed minded and now they're blocking us out and really in that psychological uh, issue that they're having, they have to always follow along with the authority that the cult has deemed is the authority of, of the cult, right? So, um, and when we, when we discuss specific cults, you will see, and we'll, we'll talk about the different leaders or founders that are leading certain cults in our society today. So we're, we're talking about the definition of a cult. We've looked at some distinguishing characteristics and, uh, of cults. And then I kind of want to jump back in, in one sense to one point, but it's really it's a whole separate point, and it's really... Um, Describing Jesus, the Son of God. Really, the description of Jesus. Because the cults have already said, Jesus is not God. It's a main uh, distinguishing characteristic of the cult. Jesus isn't God. But we want to we look to see who Jesus really is according to God's Word. Now, if you <coughs> can take your Bibles and just go to 2 Corinthians 11 now. 2 Corinthians 11. I just want to look at a few verses. Second Corinthians 11, verse number 3. But I fear... 
Paul is writing the Corinthians, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaching another Jesus, a different Jesus, whom, ye have not, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Then it goes on down in verse 12. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, it's not a surprise, because think about it. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Miss Maria mentioned earlier too, you know, there these people in cults are often deceived and, and like Satan, uh, tricking and... and deceiving other people. and That's what Paul is mentioning here. I don't want you to be deceived to a different Jesus. Maybe you might follow a, another Jesus, a, a different Jesus that somebody else is telling you about and not the true Jesus. There is one true Jesus and He is described in the Bible. And don't be surprised. They're not going to come up to you and be like, hey, by the way, we're not really teaching you the Bible, but believe our Jesus, right? They're not going to do that. They're going to look just like their father, the devil, and look nice and pretty and sound good and use great words, and it's going to be to deceive, to trick. Subtly, right? To switch your thinking, to begin to question, to begin to sway. Paul says, don't be distracted and don't start following after another Jesus. Um, yes, Amos. Yeah, I just wanted to say something about the cults that uh, they kind of show a, a false sense of happiness. Mm. You know, like, uh, for example, you look at the uh, Hare Krishna, they're walking around jumping and they, they look so happy. Uh, you, look at, you look at the uh, Hasidim Jews, and they, you know, in the holiday they're dancing and other, pe other uh, people look at them, well, it, they're so happy, mm. they must be the right mm. kind of one. But it's a false sense of, uh, of joy. Of mm. happiness. Yeah, it's not joy. Yeah. Miss yeah. Liz. I think we have a great guidance from Jesus. Very few. When he said, Who do you say I am? Mm. Yeah. And really that's a that's a great transition. Um I I I'll go ahead and call you, but you might be answering one of my questions anyway, so go ahead. Um you mentioned know your Bible. Yeah. Because they will attack you and you'll go, I mean, I mean, I mean. And also, Jesus is God. Well, it's more than, even more than knowing your Bible, it's stick to your gun because one technique is, as you said, they'll agree with you up to a point. Um, but then they'll tell you it's a mistranslation. A perfect example, which ties some of the things you said together, is John 1. Um, the word, was God. It's clear as a bell. You know, how would it be refuted? And when you ask them, well, what is the word? They're on your side. Obviously, the word is Jesus. Uh, the word was made flesh. No dispute. But then where it says the word was God, then they're back into the wall, because it says it in the Bible. 
So you'll be told it's a mistranslation. Mm -hmm. The Greek, blah, 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 and it means God light. Mm -hmm. So even if you know your Bible, like you show them that, then you have to stand firm because it goes further yeah. and tell you that, yeah, but that's not really what it means, yeah. even though that's what it says. Right. And you know what? A lot of times, the cults that are around today, right? And maybe they're a different kind of perversion of this other Jesus that they're proclaiming. It's not a new idea. Normally, these are very similar ideas that were going on about 2,000 years ago when they were perverting who the Messiah truly was. And so it's not new ideas. Maybe they have a different name, different organization, different kinds of... Uh, whatever, but it, it, it's not a new teaching, per se. All right? So, yeah, this has been going on. Paul was dealing with it, right? Paul wasn't so far removed from the time of, that Jesus was physically on the earth, but there were already people preaching a different Jesus. Like, he, he just died and risen from the dead, and now they're already proclaiming a different Jesus, Right? And so we shouldn't be surprised that there are people today proclaiming that. So here's my question now to, to, to all of us. Then who is our Jesus? I, I want you to try to think of, how, explain Jesus to us in a verse from the Bible that proves it. Okay, Warren. Huh? John 1, the Word was God. Oh, John 1, okay. Jesus is the Word, and the Word was God. So you're saying so Jesus is God? Yeah. Okay, that's good. I was, I was hoping you would say... God light, because that would be the translation. They'll say it's a translation of God. Right. It means God light. Yeah. And point out other things in the Bible. Good. That's the proof right there. That is a, that is a good proof. John 1... Uh, God, Jesus is God. Yeah, Amos. Yeah, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's mm -hmm. not I am uh, a way, I am the way. That's right. I am the truth, and I am the life. Very good. Okay. You may. Yeah, he's the word. There's, okay. Yeah, Fred. I am who I am. I am the great I am. Very good. Yeah, so... You know, he's who, who the Bible says I am. Yep. And, you know, it's really good there in Exodus, right? So that's a... We got the Old Testament verse where God says, I am uh, that who I am, right? Or I am that I am, right? So, does Jesus ever call himself I am? Yeah. Before Abraham that's right. And they tried to stone him. They tried to stone him. And that was for a reason. That's exactly right. So you, you'll see in, in the Gospel of John a few times where Jesus says, I am. I am. He calls himself, I am. Now, sometimes we not, might not notice, uh, you know, it, to make it, to flow uh, from Greek to English, right? You, it, it will be written probably I am he, but you'll see that he is italicized, right? So it's so we can understand where it, it, what it means, I am he. But he is saying, before Abraham was, I am. And it's really interesting, right? Remember in, in the Gospel of John where Judas comes with the soldiers in the garden? It gives us that, that portion of the story. Judas comes to the garden with the soldiers and who are you looking for? Um, we're looking for Jesus. And it says, he says, I am. What happens to the soldiers when he says, I am? Oh. They fall down to the ground. You're telling me Jesus Jesus didn't call himself God? Like, what, what was he saying? He said, I am he, and they just tripped over themselves? He is saying, I am God. Imagine that power. They all fall down. And then get back up. Yeah, we're looking for Jesus. Like, that's kind of comical. Like, sorry, I must have tripped. I mean, what were the... What, and, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing. Yeah. Um, I think about when we were winning the world, and you said, you know, if you believe what you're talking to, you're mm -hmm. 
Mm. He's living water. Yeah, he is a living water. That's true. Yeah. Anything else proving? Yeah, David. Brings us back to this morning's message, right? Matthew 1. His name is Emmanuel. His name is God with us. Wow. Now, you guys have done really well giving us some New Testament verses proving that Jesus is God. Yes. through Jesus. He is the only mediator. That's exactly right. And the cults will well, oh yeah, yeah, he's a mediator, but you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Doesn't work that way, right? It's only only Jesus. Nobody else is getting us there. So you guys have done really well giving us some New Testament verses that Jesus is God. That's great. Anybody have an Old Testament verse that proves that Jesus is God? Miss Liz first? Genesis 3.15 Okay. He shall bruise thy head and... Shall bruise his heel. Okay. I think that proves that Messiah is God. Okay. Yes, Mr. Pedro. Yep. That's right. Yep. Uh, I don't know where it says, but uh, in the Old Testament it says... Besides me, there is no Savior. Mm. So I believe that's Jesus talking. Yeah, there's no other. No other Savior. Yep. Yeah. Isaiah 9 6. Mm -hmm. uh, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's right. That's right. And then I think, Miss Roseanne, you had your hand that's up. That's what I was going to. She stole your verse? That's okay. <laughs> you can take it. <laughs> yes. Daniel chapter 9, mm -hmm. verse 1, it talks about the Messiah comes, he's cut off before the destruction of the second coming. Yep, that's right. Good. So, yeah. Sorry, I think it's Daniel 7.14 or 7.13 where it says, and the son uh, of man shall come on, uh, with the cloud. Mm -hmm. oh. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I don't recall the exact verse. Right, and uh, I know which one you're referring to. I don't remember the reference. But yes. I would say when they, they were in the boat and Jesus called up to the heaven to stop the storm, the storm man, who could do that? Yep, that's right. Hey, I have a question. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I, I don't remember the verse. That's right. That's right. I think Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the New Testament, it makes it very clear Jesus is the Creator, right? In Colossians, it tells us that He was the one that created all things. J Who deserves worship? God, right? Now, is, does any man deserve worship or only God? Only God. Only God. In Revelation chapter 5, we see the Father. Yeah, sorry. I couldn't hear all of them. <laughs> Forget it. All right, they pass. All right. So in Revelation chapter 5, there is praise and worship of the Father 
the one on the throne, and of the Lamb. Jesus the Messiah. You can't refute that Jesus is the, Jesus the Messiah is the Lamb there. And He's getting worship. Psalm 2. Pay homage to the Son, right? Worship the Son. You can't, you can't worship the Son if He's not God. Right? The only one worthy of worship is God. See, look, the cults will change it. They'll make a different Jesus. Oh, Jesus is a God. He's like, He is the Son of God. He's a lower form of Jehovah. He's a lower form of Yahweh. He's not Yahweh. He's a lower form. God made Him first, and then He used Him to make all things. That doesn't make any sense. Right? God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus is not a lower Son of. He is God Himself. Mormonism will teach Jesus was an angel who then took on flesh. Read Hebrews 1. Jesus is far superior than any angel. Far superior. Yeah. Genesis 26. Oh. And God said, let us make man in our image. Yeah. That's right. In our image. Yep. Let us in our. Yep. That's right. How can he how can the the Messiah's name is the Lord our Yahweh our righteousness. It's amazing, right? Um I thought I had something in my mind that I was going to say and then it's gone. So um I don't like that this is happening at 35. I feel like I feel like I should go like at least another 35 years before the memory slip is happening. But Thank you very much, Fred. He says I'm young. All right. Well, look, that's the difference. Oh, I was going to say, oh, yeah, so we did. And then, um, like, Christian science will basically say Jesus, something like Jesus didn't even really have a body. You know, he, it was like a phantom person thing. We just talked about it this morning in the morning service. He, had, he was in flesh. He was a human person, Right? He was a human, the descendant of David, right? Cheeto back here has a, has a descendant named Ethan. It turns out, Cheeto's human. Turns out his descendant, Ethan, is a human as well. If, if David has a descendant, is it not going to be human? Is it not going to be flesh, right? Doesn't that make sense? He had to have a physical body, and there we see it from our morning service. I think it was very interesting how our whole day has tied together. I noticed it uh, probably a little more than you guys because I knew what I was going to teach on in the afternoon. But I thought it was very interesting with the morning songs how we were specifically singing praise to Jesus. I will glory in my Redeemer, and we're singing of Jesus as God. And then how we come in and we're singing about Him being born, God being born as a human. And then looking at Matthew 1 and really seeing the Jesus of the Bible compared to these other Jesuses that people are teaching. Unless He's God, the whole Bible doesn't really make any sense. I don't know how they could make sense of the Bible without His being God. It really is. Is senseless. Yeah. In all these situations, he's the only one that could get get the people out of the situation. A human, a human God can't do it. You might as well just believe in whatever, right? Yeah, whatever. That's right.